this week on Arts Insight. The beauty of paper. So I just created them from either myself, so it was a knowledge of making paper flowers. It happens. To reimagine iconic imagery. It presents an opportunity for people to see their world in a more expanded kind of way. Cutting the cloth. We are making the things custom, a lot like couture fashion. It's made for a specific person. Traditional and abstract art in harmony. What else can I do in terms of abstract expressionism? So it went from still dropping the paint and splashing to forming images. And a chance to dance. Some of them come two hours before class even starts because they want to be here. They're dedicated. I'm Ernie Manus, and it's time to get arts in sight. Welcome to Arts Insight. Today, we're near the East End at Smither Park, a place littered with colorful mosaics. You can see more works from the Smither Family Collection currently on display at the Manil. But first up today, a Houston artist that assembles complex 3D paper creations all by hand. I enjoy making paper flowers because you just very quickly can see how something flat becoming three-dimensional. This is the best joy and you can talk to them and they listen and they don't talk back. My name is Belushka and I'm a paper florist. Paper floral art is a process of taking flat object as material paper and creating it into 3D, three-dimensional object flower. I taught myself how to make paper flowers and I had very limited time to do so. I just created them from either myself. So it was, I was born with it inside. So with the knowledge of making paper flowers, it happens. I enjoy making paper flowers because paper, that comes from my childhood. My parents back in Ukraine owned a printing company and they would print anything starting from business cards to books. So my childhood was all about paper. Back in Ukraine I achieved a master's in math and I think it tremendously helped me with paper flowers, which sounds strange, but you know, I use rulers and I use a pencil and inches to create my designs. From the beginning I knew that I want to do fashion, but back in Ukraine we don't really have great opportunities to study fashion. So I decided to move to America since I was fluent in English. After several years uh, being here, I realized this is my passion, this what I want to do. I always love to do things with my hands, create. Moving from fashion to paper floral world was pure accident. My sketch professor in school asked me to make paper floral backdrop for a company. And I was like, what is paper floral backdrop? She's like, Belushka, you look like you can figure it out. That's all I got as a guidance and a piece of paper. I accomplished it and realized that I was the happiest in my life while doing making paper flowers. This is it. This is my calling. I use all kinds of paper. Um, paper, you can divide it by weight. And this is what I learned from back in Ukraine from my mom. I apply lace on papers. I can dye lace and apply it on papers. This comes from a fashion background. So I got really lucky with my education and I just tried to combine it all in one art. We start with flat paper. Then um, the shapes being cut depending on the design. So I choose a design, I cut the shape depending on the style. Then you take components to the flower center and petals. So you cut your petals, you fit the petals. You either fold them or dart them or just light curl, depends. And you use different tools depending on the process. And then you put the flower base together. So this is going to be a shell. So you construct it very precisely, mathematically. You construct the base of the flower and then you design the center. So while base of the flower can be the same, but the center will always be unique. 
and then you set your center in and voila, it's done. So I spent all my life around paper. Uh, and paper is very well being preserved, so you can enjoy the artwork for a long time. And flowers, because of flowers, are international. They don't have borders, they don't have ethnicity, they don't know languages, they speak language of love. I would like people to take love from my designs. I think love is the biggest power we have as humans. And flowers talk love, speak love, per se. And I truly believe in them. They collect energy and I always give love to my flowers. See more at Belushka.com. Moving right along, a painter uses iconic imagery from the 50s and 60s to create retro pop masterpieces. I think one of the challenges of being a creative person is the difficulty in staying within the confines of sort of quote normal uh, activity because your propensity is to try to push the envelope and create something that hasn't happened before. Therefore the challenge is how to create new rules and new ways of doing things, new ways of seeing things. The more I allowed these subconscious aspects of myself to reveal themselves through the work, uh, that that became more and more interesting to me, and I really thought that it hadn't all been done yet. Some of the first things that I did uh, were to take some of the early landscape pieces that I'd done and translate them into the new idea by using them as environments to create events and circumstances to happen within. There was a great opportunity to use some of these pop, pop cultural uh, icons um, as characters in a narrative. For instance, to use uh, aliens or alien culture as part of a storytelling device where the alien represents the aspect of, for me, of ultimate creativity. was an impor important step to, uh, to go to a narrative form because I felt like there were things to talk about. And it's hard to talk about things visually in your art form without getting into storytelling because that's basically what it is. And, and all forms of art are forms of communication. In Space Masters, the picture is about differences of perception of the very same thing. The same event, the very same moment, can be seen um, in a variety of ways, including from one extreme to the other, all the way from terror of the unknown to, um, to understanding the intimacy of the moment and how it relates to all of us. Cosmic Kitchen is the juxtaposition, I think, of how we, we see the importance of our momentary activities and yet the actual reality of what's going on is so much bigger. The reason that I like to use these older images from popular culture is because I consider them uh, basically a shared visual vernacular in our culture. It seems regardless of the generation that you come from or, or your background, uh, these are things that are recognizable in some cultural sense. And I, I use it as what I call a bridge to bring the viewer into the painting. One of the primary aspects of uh, pop surrealism is the reintroduction of narrative as a legitimate form of uh, communication. I, 
I think the, the primary artist's job is, is to reflect their version of the world. As it, that reflection applies to the viewer, it's the viewer's job to accept that or not and to put those reflections and that perception through, through a filter that results in a, a way of seeing things that is different than the norm and, and a way of mirroring back uh, aspects of reality that people aren't ordinarily um, aware of. And so it presents an opportunity for people to see their world in a more expanded kind of way. Find out more at DennisLarkins.com. Up next, an opera costume shop's extravagant pieces help tell stories through clothing. Welcome to the Arizona Opera Costume Shop, and uh, today we're actually working on a couple different things. I'm Kathleen Trott, and I'm the costume shop manager at Arizona Opera. Arizona Opera's actual physical building is located in the downtown area of Phoenix. So we're all here professionals who have chosen to do this as our career, and many of us have degrees in this field. We are making the things custom a lot like couture fashion. It's made for a specific person. Generally four or five months out, the general director, Ryan, and our director for that specific production and our designers have met several times and had discussions about the way that the company as a whole wants the show to be developed. So once they've met and decided the flow of the, the show, um, then the designer and the director will have conversations about specifics for characters. Is this character... Um, are they emotionally driven? Are they very logical? H what kind of colors is the director imagining that this character wears? And then you also discuss the actual logistical problems. Like, well, he gets money, so he needs to have a pocket to put the money in because it has to go somewhere. So then the designer will do some rough sketches, put together some research, maybe some color swatches. And the designer and the director will go back and forth about, well, I like that shape, but not that color. Or they actually need another dress, not just one, because we think that it's important for the development that we see that their clothes are changing as their character changes that kind of thing and then the designer will do sort of final renderings and the final renderings are in color and they sort of more clearly express the ideal costume that will be created at the end of the process and then the shop will take the renderings and the measurements of our performers and create the costumes so our draper Cece it's her job to take the measurement sheet and the flat rendering and create a pattern so that it can be put together into a three-dimensional garment. This is uh, one of my rough sketches from Arizona Lady, which is our first show of our next season. This is for Nellie. She's a vaudeville actress. So this is another fabric for her. And I can lay it out. Um, with the right side, the right side is the the pretty side down against the table and then I'll take my pattern piece and I'll line it up on the fabric and then mark on my fabric with something that won't show from the outside but that I can see here and then that's the line I would cut on and then it gets all folded together into a pile like this so this is one of the robes for Magic Flu. And Cece has patterned it all already, and then it's all been cut out. And then we write quick instructions on the paper here so that our stitcher could come and pick up this pile of pieces, read the instructions, and then start building it. After the garment is cut out, 
into its pieces. Our stitchers will put it together and stitchers stitch, it's pretty self-explanatory <laughs> name. So they'll pin it together and sew it. And generally we will then call our performer back in for another fitting that is the actual garment, but it's not a final fitting. So the closure might not be in yet. The hem might not be done. Trim won't be put on things like that. So that way we can put the actual garment on to make sure that it, it looks the way that we want it to before we finish the whole thing. And then our wardrobe supervisor is in charge of making sure that the costumes that were designed by the designer maintain their look at the performance space. And it's their job to wash what needs to be washed after each performance, iron and steam what needs to be ironed, to make sure that the performers are wearing pants when they should be wearing pants and not wearing them when they shouldn't be wearing them. And that they're the correct pants and not the wrong pants. You'd be surprised. And then when we strike the show, striking the show means that you take it all down and bring it all back to wherever you're storing it or if you rent it or borrowed it that you pack it up and send it back. So everything will get washed and then after it's clean it all gets sorted back into our stock and some things stay together as a show. So right now Cincinnati Opera has uh, Don Pasquale which we did a couple seasons ago and that whole show in our stock stayed together because we knew when we struck that show that that show was going to be rented. It just depends on the actual style of the show and if we have companies that we know want it immediately, whether or not it's kept together or it's separated out by time period and by men, women, child. It's nice for people to realize when they see something that's lovely on stage to just sort of at some point be a little bit aware of the amount of work and heart that goes in to the thing that's on stage as well because often our blood a little bit and sometimes tears goes into the garment that's on stage. You can find out more by visiting azopera.org. Now one artist produces stunning works that range from abstract designs to recreations of familiar brands. My interest in art has been something developed since I was a small child. I picked up a pencil and would copy whatever my dad would do as, a, as an artist and uh, just grew from there. So drawing people, drawing animals, cars, airplanes, whatever I could draw and it developed quite a bit from there. I did do high school education for art but I pursued a business degree instead and didn't think that art would be a career more of just a hobby when I began. But uh, after getting a couple of degrees and realizing that uh, art was maybe more than a hobby for me, um, I started pursuing it quite a bit more and uh, developed a unique style and started developing clients and it grew from there. I've been here just short of two years. The gallery itself uh, was open just about three years ago. We do represent Timothy Raines. This began with him. He very much is a contemporary expressionist, a colorist. Uh, he can work from abstraction to realism. He's also licensed with Major League Baseball to create their beautiful logos and his style of splatter and splash. The process that I developed um, came around um, as a uh, just happenstance. I had actually been uh, more of an illustrator um, when I was younger uh, up through college and did some illustration on the side but uh, abstract was something that I appreciated but didn't quite understand. I felt like throwing paint on canvas to cover a, a wall space in my house was the way to go and um, it looked simple and accessible. After a while, someone asked me, could you do a flower in your style? And I thought, well, that's interesting. Um, I'll do that. So I had done a flower. Um, those really took off with a lot of people. And I thought, when I can make a flower, what else can I do in terms of abstract expressionism? So it went from still dropping the paint and splashing to forming images um, in that style. As I paint, I start with a layer uh, a base layer of color, usually it's just white uh, as a media to uh, absorb 
and change uh, each color as, as it hits. So that creates a lot of the interest in blending there. A lot of times I'll paint an image down first with a brush, so I'll have almost a fully developed painting on the more complex artworks before I even start splashing the, the paint. In my painting I use uh, acrylic. Uh, they're more fluid acrylics than the typical thing you get out of a tube and uh, a lot of what I do in terms of the color choices I make um, are based on how certain colors mix together so I've done a lot of color sampling um, you know a certain orange might not work with a certain red uh, the way I want it to and so there's some limitations to what I uh, pursue artistically based on the, the technical you know the technical aspects of my uh, paints I usually kind of separate it into six or seven primary colors so an image is um, quite a bit uh, simplified and then I use that simplified image as a basis for my uh, splash painting. On the straight abstract works uh, when I know that I'm done is usually just a balance um, and of uh, you know the technical execution um, the the color um, it's just a feeling I get. It's, it's, those aren't typically hard to uh, overdo uh, with paint. Uh, the images, when I, when I start to execute an image, then it's a little bit more dicey because if I put too much paint or decide I've gone too far, that, that can be too late because it's uh, all about minimalism and, and control and not getting too carried away. A lot of my inspiration does come from collectors though when they'll bring me a unique idea um, or concept that they'd like to have executed in my style um, as long as they give me a lot of leeway to choose the, uh, the image, the visual, take photographs of the event um, or of the concept. Staying motivated as an artist can be a challenge surprisingly. Um, I don't necessarily need to wait for inspiration. I think that if you do you'll often not find it you know there's plenty of quotes about that but uh, you know I think being able to do something just for myself um, keeps me going for more information visit timothyrains.com and finally tonight a married ballet duo who spend their days teaching young dancers not just the steps but the discipline that the art requires <laughs> These kids, some of them come two hours before class even starts, and not because their moms are like, oh, I need to go somewhere else, I gotta drop you off early, but because they want to be here, they're dedicated. Now we're gonna do it together, though, so Nigel has to keep up. And three, quick your legs, and close, four. I just think Juan and Stephanie attract people who really wanna come here and work. It's not necessarily a social outlet for them. I mean, they can do social outlet elsewhere. Slow, allow the machine to help you to feel the muscles. What they won't find anywhere nearby, at least, is an array of Pilates and gyrotonic machines like this. Pretty as sculptures, designed to help dancers and regular folks alike rehab injuries and gain better body control. The couple had already been using some in a small business based out of their home. Until about five years ago, they decided to up the ante and open a school of their own. Stephanie remembers the first time they spotted this somewhat unexpected location. We drove into downtown Overland Park. There was one parking spot, and it was right outside this building, and a big sign that said, for sale. <laughs> and uh, we peeked in the window, and at that point, we didn't realize how big the space was or what it, what it could potentially turn into. One of the things I always said is that I could never teach for recreational purpose. So if we were gonna get involved in a ballet school, I wanted the ballet school to be professional. So this is not a favor, this is not about finances, this is, it is about art. And if the kids are good, they're moved up. If they're not good, they have to stay where they are. We have parents that have been with us since we started the school, and they see this progress in their kids, and they're fascinated by it how serious the kids are taking what they do, even though that they're very young, how what we teach them here in the classroom, they're able to take it into uh, everyday activities. Now offering six levels of instruction in a complex that's larger than it looks from outside, 
It's hard to believe the KSCB started with only three students enrolled. When they opened up, we came here, we followed them over, and haven't looked back. Julie Horton's oldest son, Riley, was one of that original trio. He's now studying and working with the Houston Ballet. At 15, her younger son, Connor, aspires to do much the same. This is maybe where we spend more of our waking hours than we do at our house. We're very grateful. I don't think every ballet school feels like family, but this really does. It's a family where language isn't much of a barrier. Like many Colombian kids, Juan grew up amidst great poverty. He credits Inco Ballet, the school he attended in Cali, with literally changing his life. So now each summer, students from South America arrive in Johnson County to spend several weeks taking classes and training on the kind of equipment they might not otherwise have access to. He was in their shoes and look where he is now and look, look at our studio and look at, at his career and it gives them inspiration that maybe they can do that too. It's the best part of the summer when the Colombians come and they have no idea what I'm saying and I have no idea what they're saying. And, but you know, that's the great thing about dance is that you don't necessarily have to talk. Ay, ay, ay. Traffic problems here. It transforms this studio into something different, which is what I think is so special about it for our home kids. Um, you know, this, this studio becomes an international dance studio. It's an amazing experience, it really is. Every year, more and more kids from Colombia have been able to participate. But Monica Guerrero has been involved all along. She's known Juan for decades. Now her duties include both training the school's instructors and fine-tuning its curriculum. Every time I come, I learn something, and I'm always learning something from him. He thinks that I'm giving something to the school, but I think the other way. Let's do plié as we close, so don't close first plié. One is looking for those boys and girls who have great opportunities in their bodies, but they don't have the opportunities economically. That's totally true with him. If it was up to Juan, he, everyone would go free. So he, yeah, that's really would be his goal. In fact, 30% of the Kansas School of Classical Ballet's students attend on scholarship. Juan calls it giving back. That also describes Let's Move, a new project recently undertaken with KVC hospitals. It brings basic dance training to troubled youths at a residential treatment facility in KCK. You know, they're excited for something new and it's a place for them to get away from the chaos that they're in. To walk in there and be able to just not think about anything else for a little while, but how to move my body and what's going on. When you're there, you see these kids smiling, you see these kids uh, playing, being creative, feeling comfortable in their own skin. To be able, as a person, to provide that, it is a privilege. Community support has nurtured this program specifically and the school's quest for excellence in general. But it's hard to picture so much growth in such a short time if it weren't for the creative couple at its core. As much as I'm saying that we've been for 20 years together, I actually think if we were an average couple, we've been together for 40 right, because we live together, we work together, everything has been together. But she's an incredible partner. I think that she's one of the best teachers I know. She's a very smart lady, she married right. <laughs> for more information, visit kfcballet.com. And that does it for this episode of Arts Insight. For everyone at Houston Public Media, I'm Ernie Manoos. Thanks for watching, and have a great week.